about climate change. I know this is a very common word that a lot of people almost are tired of and this is the book. It's the book of Bill Gates, uh, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, the Solutions We Have and the Breakthroughs We Need. Um, I can tell that Bill did a lot of research for this book and there's one thing that I really like about this book, the fact that it's, it's filled with data and really thoroughly researched affirmations. So there's no sentence that Bill is writing without having the data to back it up. But three-thirds of the book is about are about the problem and only one this small part of the book is about the solutions. I wish there would have been more space allocated for the solutions. So the goal the goal for us it should be to reach to zero from 51 billions of tons of greenhouse effect gases we should reach to zero by 2050 and this is not something to be taken lightly it's really really serious because the climate change is caused by the richest nations on the planet and the ones that suffer the most are those that are living in poor areas of the planet that did not contribute so much to the problem yet when they are faced with the consequences of the climate change they suffer the most for example a farmer in Kenya in case of drought or in case of a natural disaster that is happening because of the climate change is not as good as equipped in comparison with a farmer from Texas for example so this is the irony, I think, of the problem because climate change is caused by the richest nations and yet it affects the poor and makes them even poorer. And this is really unfair, I would say. So I've taken some notes from the book as usual. And uh, what's very important for you to know is that this climate change is real and it's not so much a cliche and some people think that it's a joke but if you have been living for more than three decades on this planet you probably have noticed that the winters are not the same the springs are not the same the seasons tell us how the planet is getting warmer and warmer and Bill says that we will have a rise in temperature, we will have much more storms that are quite violent. He mentions the Hurricane Maria in, in um, Puerto Rico that happened in 2017 that, and that made Puerto Rico regress with 20 years. So it, it pushes you back. So just like a war, just like a hurricane, just like a tornado, just like a fire, anything that's happening and it's dis destroying the infrastructure, the environment, it pushes you back. So 20 years of progress have been down the toilet. So this is not something that should be taken lightly. 
um, so the drought, um, the rise of temperature affects the corals and as a consequence it also affects the fishermen, the, the, the farmers, everything. So temperature is very small little thing like one degree or two degrees that looks small to you on a bigger level, on a bigger scale, it has enormous consequences. Yeah, there's also talk about the coal industry and the uh, fossil fuel industry that is producing, for example, now the biggest CO2 on the planet. Um, and Bill names uh, five, five big contributors to the CO2 that we have in the atmosphere. The biggest one uh, and the biggest um, contributor to the greenhouse effect uh, gases that are being released, it's the production process. So the steel, the plastic, the concrete, this, these industries are very, very polluting they are responsible for 31% of these gases. The second is about uh, the electricity, connecting to electricity, 27%, agriculture, 19%, uh, transportation, 16%, and heating or cooling the air indoors. It's uh, seven percent. So just just to give you an idea, um, Bill talks about a lot of projects that manage to uh, come to fruition or are on the brink of coming to fruition, and uh, about producing greener electricity. Uh, he also mentions nuclear energy and. If you don't believe it, read Bill. Uh, the nuclear energy, um, it's the only energy and it's the only source of energy without carbon emissions. So it's the greenest of them all. And more people have died because of coal exploitation uh, than because of nuclear accidents, you know? So I know that nuclear is a very loaded word and a lot of people are scared about it, but um, it shouldn't be like this. And there are some projects going on uh, in France uh, planning to uh, generate plasma and uh, extra energy from the nuclear processes like uh, fusion, for example. The only issue with nuclear energy is finding a way to deal with the nuclear waste that can remain radioactive, radioactive for a couple of hundreds of years. Um, there's also talk about the agriculture and about the pioneer work that Norman Borlaug has done in developing a sort of wheat that had uh, a shorter stem and a larger size and that has helped millions of farmers and almost all of the plants of wheat that we have now are because of the work of this um, person that also took a Nobel Award in 1970. So on a global scale uh, we also have an issue with deforestation and it's an irony that we are removing the trees that can help us clean the atmosphere and not only that we are removing them but we are burning them therefore polluting even more the atmosphere. To give you an idea, one tree can absorb four tons of CO2 on a lifespan of 40 years. So maintaining the forests is also another key element that Bill talks about. Uh, there also talks about 
fuels and gas <laughs> one one liter of gas is cheaper than one liter of soda at least in the united states so it's very difficult to convince the big uh, fuel industry <clears throat> titans to give up this cheap alternative and go green because green means more taxes it means more a much a much bigger cost so that's an issue it's like a vicious circle with green energy in the sense that it can help us but in the same time the costs are quite high you know so we need to find an alternative that is also um, budget friendly and planet friendly yeah Uh, there are small mentions of attempts of building green and uh, green green buildings and Bill mentions the bullet center in Seattle one of the greenest commercial buildings in the world the issue with uh, with that is the fact that the costs for building such uh, such a place are very very high and very few people are willing to have these costs for a building um, there are talks about the wind energy and Denmark is being mentioned as being one of the biggest exporters of wind turbines in the world and they're also producing half of the electricity they need from using this amazing resource called the wind energy so kudos to you denmark and i think that we need more countries to be able to do a research when it comes to the natural resources they have that could help them uh, in having energy from a different source than the classical one so wind energy is an example of it um yeah so the population is rising we need more places to live um, that will also have an impact because as i have stated producing steel uh plastic um concrete is the activity that pollutes the most so I think we need innovations. So the part with the solutions <laughs> uh, at the end of the book in chapter 11 and in chapter 12 uh, is basically about funding research, funding science, because we need scientists and we need uh, research in order to see, okay, what does it work for us? and research and science is seriously underfunded and yeah we all need that brilliant guy with that brilliant idea that finds and innovates but how many of these guys are on the planet you know and not only that how many of them have the money to put into action their crazy ideas maybe but you know a crazy idea is crazy until it's not so crazy anymore and it saves lives, you know. Uh, we also need to uh, be aware that we as citizens can have an impact. I don't want to crush anyone's pleasure for burgers, <laughs> but it would be a good idea to decrease your consumption of burgers and of meat in general and animal product because the animals require a lot of land in order to produce that one pound of meat or call it as you want and uh, there are better alternatives you know so the, the market functions with uh, offer and demand you know demand and offer so if you if we as people on a smaller level start to work on our demands that are much more environmentally friendly then the offer will come 
to us so the big players in the industries like food and energy uh, and uh, fuels will listen to the client so I think here is like a vicious circle because green energy in the moment it costs a lot and people are now motivated they're, they're not motivated um, to say okay I will dump my SUV or my normal car and I'll get an electric car but it will cost me more and I can't use it on long distances and so it's a bit of a hindrance to apply the new technologies and uh, infuse them in your life but it's necessary because uh, we need to have a a long-term vision in the sense that for the moment we are stuck on this planet <laughs> like nobody's getting out alive and our children and our grandchildren and grand-grandchildren will have to breathe the air that we are polluting so I think that this book is very good from a technical point uh, but maybe a little bit more emotion would have sold the story better because a lot of people don't care about themselves that much but they, they care more about their children or their pets or they, their grandchildren in order to make a difference so I think people and citizens in general would need uh, more education and more education uh, to be included in schools, to be included in universities and yeah, to, to invite the consumer to know the price that the planet is paying for their options. Uh, yeah, the car you are driving, the air conditioning that you are buying that maybe is cheap but it consumes more energy um, and you have no clue about it. So each citizen should be informed about the, uh, the carbon footprint they are having on the planet, you know. And it's a, it's a serious matter because uh, we can see, we can see a rise in temperature, we can see um, a blurring between the seasons uh, back in the days, and this sounds like I'm very old, but back in the days, you could definitely tell when spring is coming, when winter is coming, when autumn is like, there would be very big differences in temperatures, you know, but now, in February the weather is like completely messed up it's like we didn't have this type of uh, February 10 years ago for example so you can feel it it's it's palpable it's visible that the winters are gone the glaciers like they're melting like I, I don't even imagine 20 or 30 years from now how will it be if we don't do anything and this issue with climate change makes me think of a story with a frog that was sitting very comfortable very comfortably in a pot in a in a in a pot with water that was slowly slowly heating because it was on a stove and the frog was sitting and enjoying the warm water without realizing that that water is going to boil eventually and it will lead, lead the frog to, uh, to the death, you know? And I feel like with the climate change, uh, the approach is similar in the sense that we are like sitting in the phenomena and it's like we, we are not waking up to the realization that if we don't do anything, we will all <laughs> not, not boil to death, but it will be very difficult for a lot of people. And unfortunately, those in the poorer areas will take the bullet 
for uh, the ignorance of the people in the richest areas and on a human level that's not fair so yeah uh, this is a very good book I highly recommend it for anyone from teenager to adult to retired person like we all live on this planet and we're not getting out alive so we should really think about the legacy and the air that we are leaving for the upcoming generations thank you very much for watching and see you next time bye